2 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to read a few more verses than we normally do this morning, but bear with me. We'll get to the thought. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Now in this passage, the Apostle Paul begins by saying, We know, meaning it's plain. It's been taught before. It can be observed. It's something that you don't have to doubt. You know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. In other words, as soon as this one goes back to the ground, I've got a body that the Lord has prepared for me. We like to sing about streets of gold, and you know, I'll have a mansion somewhere over the hilltop. A mansion's not going to matter once we get there. He prepared one for you because He loved you, and He wanted you to have a place at the Father's house. That's why the Father's house has many mansions. But... None of that's going to matter. When we get there, you're not going to need a house. We're going to be with the Lord forevermore. But, it says we have a building of God, in verse number 1, and a house not made with hands, eternal, in the heavens. This tabernacle, go study your Old Testament, Testament economy, the tabernacle was the temporary structure that they were able to take down, move, and then reassemble as the children of Israel traveled through the wilderness. Once they finally got to where they had a permanent home where God led them into the promised land, you find that they had the temple. The tabernacle was always meant to be temporary. From the moment that you took a breath, this flesh was going back to the dirt and it knew it. From the moment that you were conceived in your mother's womb, God knew exactly how long this body was going to last you. The Bible says that he's put a number on every man's head. He knows the day that this is going back to the ground. Right? But notice what it says that he prepared for you. It doesn't say that he prepared a tabernacle for you. It says he prepared a house. You know what the temple was referred to in the Old Testament? The house of the Lord. What's he saying? The one that he's got for you, you're never going to need to take that one off. It's permanent. It's meant to be resided in. Not meant to be taken down and then moved right, for a temporary amount of time. No, it's permanent. He says, verse number 2, For in this we groan. Well, I thought verse number 1 was pretty happy news. But he says, no, in this we groan. And it causes us a little bit of strife. There's something deep down on the inside that it just rubs us the wrong way to know that this is the tabernacle. But what are you talking about, Brother Jordan? Well, Paul says, Earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. He says, I'm chomping at the bit to get the one that's better than what I got now. He's saying, I'm growing, saying, Lord, let me be what I know one day I will be in you. Verse number three says, If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. When did Adam and Eve realize, or when did Adam and Eve's being unclothed become a problem? After they realized they had sinned. When they had sinned, they had shame and they had something to hide. Here the Apostle Paul says, Right now, even though I've got this tabernacle on, he says, there's a whole lot of things that need to be hidden. This tabernacle isn't perfect. This tabernacle's got a whole lot of problems with it. It's still cursed by sin. That's why it's going back to the ground and it's not going to glory with us. He says, we desire that once that heavenly home is bestowed upon us that heavenly house says that we not be found naked 
what are we going to look like when we get to glory? We're going to look like Him. Nothing about Jesus that's worth hiding. You don't need to cover any of that up. We'll be able to take pride and glory in what we are rather than feeling shame for what we're still dealing with down here. But verse number 4, he says, For we that are in this tabernacle, talking about this temporary flesh, do groan, being burdened. What's that burden? We'll get to that here in a minute, but keep that in mind. He says, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed. He's saying, we're not aspiring to go back and be heathens, to be barbarians, as we heard preached about this weekend. Right? We don't want to be that crowd that goes around and does what's right in their own eyes. He says, that's not why we're grieved. He says, but rather clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. He says, we've received good now. In fact, he goes on to talk about the earnest of the Holy Ghost. We just got the down payment on our salvation. He says, we know that the Holy Ghost moved in and we are His tabernacle. But this flesh, our tabernacle, it's going away one day and then we'll receive the fullness of salvation. He says, we groan, we desire, we're begging in our spirit to have that more perfect thing that we, by faith, we can see it through the Scriptures. What are we going to look like? I don't know, but we're going to look like Him. Well, what's He look like? Well, John was limited in the words he could use. And, you know, he was trying to use words that we understood to explain it, but he, in the book of Revelation, explains what he saw. He had face like brass. He had eyes full of fire, hair white as snow. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's nobody that looks anything like Him. But when we get there, we're going to look just like Him says we're not groaning to go back to what we were. He says we're tired of the sin. We're tired of the flesh. We're tired of the old man wrestling with us every day. He says we do groan that that imperfection will be swallowed up in perfection. That mortality be swallowed up with immortality. He's saying that one that we've got, it's going to last us for all eternity. Nothing wrong with it. Never will be anything wrong with it. All we're wanting is to take off the old and to put on the new. He says, but it, gro it, it burdens us. We groan to have that new thing. Verse number 5, Now he that wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit, which we just talked about. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. He says, we're confident that we know one day it's coming. As long as we're alive here, we're absent from the Lord. But just the day that He calls us, whether we go by the grave, go through the rapture, the moment that it happens, we'll be with Him. So what verse number 8 says, For we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But see, go back to verse number 5. It says, Now He that hath wrought us for this selfsame thing is God. You know what God intended when He saved you? That for a while, not for forever, but for a while, you would be wrapped in this earthly tabernacle, the flesh, that you would receive the Holy Ghost, who, as we've heard preached all week, weekend long, right, leads us and guides us into all truth. He is both our schoolmaster, but He's also our corrector. He convicts us to show us what is true from the Word of God and what God wants in your life. He gave you the earnest of your salvation so that you could rule and reign over this flesh for a time and compel it to do what is the will of God. It says, who wrought us for this self-same work? God did. That's what God intended. That's what God equipped you for. It's what Jesus when he said he must go so that the Holy Ghost could come. He said it's better for the Holy Ghost to be here because it will be me living in you. He says it's, it's going to work out just the way that God intended it. So, the Apostle Paul here in verse number 1 and several times on down through this, it says that we groan. 
He's saying, I've just got a little glimpse of what God's got for us on the other side. I'm all ready to go. He's saying, I don't want to be stuck in this flesh anymore. He says, I want to go on and be home, you know, go home, be with the Lord forevermore. I want to be like Him. He says he's burdened by it. He's burdened that he loves the Lord so much he just wants to go be with Him. But he says he grunt, it causes him discomfort in this flesh. Later on, the Apostle Paul says that he was torn between the two. Whether to go or whether to stay. Why do he want to go? Because he wants to be with the Lord. But why did he have something that caused him to want to stay? He said, for other people's sake. That as long as he was here, God could still use him to minister to others. That was a struggle that he felt in his soul. Now I'd say it's very rare in today's iteration of the church that there are very few people who are waking up every morning and asking God to help them because they just want to be in heaven so much that they're tired of living in this world. I'm sure it happens. But the Apostle Paul says, no, that's a daily burden I've got to carry. I want to go so bad that I'm tired of this place. But yet at the same time, he still knows that he has work to do down here. Look at verse number 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body. He says, if you gave me a choice, I'd be in heaven. He says, we're willing to be, but I just can't be. Verse number 8. He says, and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. The Apostle Paul said, I had to stop thinking about which body I'd rather be in. That's up to God. God chooses where I'm at, what, I, what makes up my being by Him and through Him do all things consist. He said, I had to stop thinking about it. I had to get my eyes off of what I was stuck in and what was prepared for me. But if you was driving a jalopy into the parking lot today and you knew that somewhere across town somebody had put a down payment on a Rolls Royce for you and all you had to do was show up and get the keys for it it was already yours it's paid for it's waiting it's got your names engraved into the seats there's a place for you at the master's table in glory he's got a house for you right he's got a place around the throne where for all eternity you're going to be there worshiping and praising him having fellowship with him in the flesh he wants you to see him as he really is and he wants you to be seen of God as what he intended you to be. You'll finally be what it was that God wants to turn you into the completed work of God that started the day that you got saved. Everything's going to be better over there. Well, if you drove in into Jalopy and it was just across town and you could go get it, why wouldn't you? Well, the issue is I'm not the one that gets to make that choice. I didn't give myself life. I can't take life away from myself. Right? How dare we say that, well, Lord, I'm ready to go. Not if He's not ready for you to be there. You know what that tells me? If you're ready, but God's not ready for you to leave, it tells me that you're not right with God. You're not in the perfect will of God. The Apostle Paul says, this is what I decided in verse number 9. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. He said, I got tired of feeling, looking at what would be best in my eyes. He says, of course it'd be best for me to be in that glorified body. Well, not if God still has someone He wants you to win down here. The Apostle Paul later said that he was willing that he would be accursed, or in other words, lose his salvation and go to hell, if all of Israel would come to be saved. You say, what do you think was more important to the Apostle Paul, Brother Jordan? I think the Apostle Paul cared more about people getting saved than him having his glorified body. I think God cares more about more being added to the family than those that are in the family graduating to that heavenly body. What do you say, Brother Jordan? I'm saying God's got a time and a place for everything. And when it's God's will for us to go, there's no other place we ought to want to be. But as long as it's God's will for us to be here, we've got things that we've still got to take care of. But what do we glean 
in these first couple of verses about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul hates his flesh. He despises it. He says, Lord, I know I'm stuck in it, but I don't like it. Yesterday I was afraid Brother Jeff Ledbetter was going to start preaching this part of my Sunday school lesson, but he went a different direction. The Apostle Paul said of himself, O wretched man that I am. He called himself the chiefest of sinners. He knew that before he got saved, he was the enemy of God. That he actually persecuted the one that he thought he was serving and worshiping. When the Apostle Paul looked at his flesh, he saw no good thing. He hated himself in the flesh. No wonder he wanted to graduate to that glorified body. But at some point, he had to come to accept that he was still stuck in what he despised so much. The Apostle Paul desired to be closer to God. Well, how close did he want to get that he looked exactly like Christ? If some people today had a burden for truly being accepted, like he said in verse number 9, that whether you be in the flesh or you be in spirit and glory, you'd be accepted of Him. Him who? God. Well, you know what it takes to be accepted in the beloved? you got to look like Christ. What happened when your soul was saved? When you made that trip to Calvary and asked Him to save you? What happened? Well, He robed you in His righteousness so that you, the Father would see Him when He looked at you. Why did He do that? Because that's just a placeholder until you get to glory and you really do look like Him. But the Apostle Paul says, Lord, I know that in this flesh I truly can't be what you desire me to be. But yet, he believes that he can still be accepted of God. What well, he's saying, there's enough that you can do that you can be accepted by God, approved of. Accepted means that not only is there a place for you, he receives you and puts you in that place. You can mail something to somebody, but unless they accept it, it don't get delivered. They go to the mailbox and say, I don't want that. They put it back in there and say, return to sender. It wasn't accepted. If you write a check to somebody else and their bank doesn't accept it, they're not getting the money. If you're not accepted of God, that means that He's not allowing you to be in the place that He intended you to be. He says, this is where you ought to be, but I can't accept you the way that you are. The Apostle Paul realized that even though I hate this flesh, even though I hate my carnal man, that he had to die daily. But in all of that, the Apostle Paul realized, i got to stop walking by sight. Look at verse number 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. What's he walking towards? He wants to be accepted of God. That's his goal. Whether I be here, whether I be there. Whether I stay or whether he take me, my goal is to be accepted. Well, in order to be accepted over there, you're going to have to stand before a judgment seat. That's what he goes on to talk about from verse number 9 all the way down to the end of the chapter. Now, you're going to have to give an account of the deeds done in this body that you hate. So you might as well compel it to do what is right. In order to be accepted over there, you're going to have to do what it takes down here to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. One day we'll pass through the the fire, that judgment of God that we heard about this weekend. And it'll be revealed what was hay and wood and stubble and what was gold, silver, and precious gems. And one day we'll receive our place in glory and we'll be accepted forevermore. But he's saying, when I stand before God at the judgment seat, I want to be accepted. I don't want to be rebuked. I want the Lord to say, here's all, what all your labor went on to prosper, to be rewarded as. He says, here's the measure of your work. It lasted longer than life. I mean, come on, we're reading a book of the Bible that he wrote some 2,000 years ago. God preserved the work of the Apostle Paul. But he's saying, when I get to the other side, I want to see that what I did meant something to God rather than meant nothing. It didn't get past this carnal life. It had no eternal ramifications. It says, what I want, I'm going to be accepted. Well, in order to be accepted at a certain point, 
you've got to accept some things down here. That's why he said we walk by faith and not by sight. So in order to be accepted of God, you first have to accept that you can't just look in the mirror all day long. Remember he said, O wretched man that I am, chiefest of sinners, he called himself. He knew how wicked this flesh was, but he didn't sit there and stare at it all day long. Yes, the Word is a mirror, that a glass, that when we look into it, we can behold what we truly are. Why does God show you that so that you get it addressed and made right? God doesn't want you living in defeat because you see how wicked and carnal this flesh is. This flesh will never be saved. This flesh will never be holy. This flesh will never get to a point where God accepts it, and it knows that. So what's the apostle? He says, I walk by faith. I look and I see what I have a problem with spiritually in the Word of God. He says, and by the Lord's grace, I get those things made right. If the Lord shows me that I've got iniquity or something that I've regarded in my heart that he's not proud of, I repent and I get it made right, like we've heard about this weekend. He says, but I also, once I've taken care of what the Lord has dealt with me about, I go on and continue to labor for the Lord. I don't throw me a pity party. I don't hold the mirror up and ask anybody else if they see anything wicked in it. I don't look at myself and see all the things that are wrong. By faith I step out and look at all the things that God finds right in my life. He says it's a choice. You can either stay defeated in your flesh because there is no strength in your flesh. Right? The Bible says that the arm of flesh will fail you. The Bible says you're trusting the Lord in all His might. Why? Because in your flesh, you don't have victory. You don't have the ability to go out and even hold yourself together, let alone everything in your life. In your flesh, you've got no hope. We've already talked about it. it's damned to go back to this dust of the earth. In your flesh, there is no good thing. Right? You can't even control your own heart. It's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. How can you control something that you can't even understand? What are you saying? You can look in the mirror all day long and find a whole lot of things wrong. That's walking by sight. That's what you see. You can deal with you can see the flesh. You can look at yourself and find all kinds of problems. I don't find that God ever wants a Christian to be the reason that in their life they're not being productive. God doesn't want you sitting there with a magnifying glass finding all the things wrong with your flesh. Because your flesh ain't going to glory. God wants you to look at your spirit to be spiritually minded. God wants you to be so concerned about His will that you constrain the flesh to do the will of God. They say greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. You know what that means? You get a good hold of God, you're going to be able to live in the flesh the way that God finds acceptable. Does it say that you'll be perfect? No. But it says that you can live accepted of God. What's that mean? You can strain, compel this flesh, you control the flesh. James said that if any man can offend not in word, that if he can control his tongue, that that man is a perfect man. I talk about sinless, but that he's got control over this flesh. You can be accepted of God in this flesh. But you're not going to do it if you're sitting there looking in the mirror all day long, looking at all the things that are wrong with the flesh, looking at all the things wrong with other people's flesh. No, if you want to be accepted, you've got to walk by faith. Well, in order to walk by faith, what do you have to see? Well, to be accepted of God, you have to first accept or acknowledge that you have a call on your life. Go in the Bible any time that a king had sons as princes that he didn't give them responsibility. That he didn't give them a piece of what he owned and then give them jurisdiction over it. That the princes would go out and judge or rule or enforce what it is that the king said. Why did that happen? Because the king knew not everybody could see him directly but they could see one of his representatives. 
And he trusted his children to go out and to be good representatives of the king. God's put a call on your life that you are a representative of his heavenly kingdom. God's still very concerned about the kingdom of heaven, even though people don't preach on it too much nowadays. One day it's coming. And one day that's the only kingdom that will remain. But until then, he's got a job for you to do to point people in that direction. If you don't admit or recognize that by faith, you're more than what you see in the mirror. We can't see what God sees when he looks at us. We don't see us robed in the righteousness of Christ, but by faith, I can look in this Bible and see that it's true. But Brother Jordan, I just don't feel like that's me today. That's irrelevant. In God's eyes, you're the same as His Son. Not because you are today, but because one day you will be. That because of that, God extends grace and mercy and blessings on your life down here as a reward for what Christ did for you. You didn't earn any of it. But Brother Jordan, God's just been... So, I never understood this argument, Brother Ron. But God's just been so good to me, I just don't feel like there's anything that I could do to go out and show how appreciative I am. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that. But if you're so appreciative that you just didn't know what to do, you'd go do something. Feeling unworthy isn't an excuse to not go out and do something. In fact, it's the opposite. Those that realized how much they didn't have a claim to God usually do the most for God afterwards. Jesus said it this way, that the one that was forgiven much would be the one that was most thankful, most appreciative, most loyal to the Master. Us, we're just sitting there and saying, Oh Lord, look at what a mess I am today. Look at what He's turned you into already. The Bible says your conversation is recorded in glory. He already knows what you're going to say once you get there. The only thing missing is you in glory. He's got everything else there. Right before a baby's born, they make up a nursery. Baby's name's on the wall. They've already got pillows embroidered, and it's got names, and it's got, you know, family trees already being added to it. What, it everything's waiting on the baby. The baby's just not there yet. If you ask somebody, who's that room belong to? Well, it belongs to the baby. Well, where's the baby at? The baby's not here yet. How can the baby have something when the baby's not here yet? You can't own something unless you're here to take possession of it. Tell that to God. Because that's what He's got waiting on you in glory. He's already got your house. He's already got your apparel. He's already got the food ready for you at the marriage supper. Everything's ready, just waiting on you. What are you saying? If you start thinking of yourself like that, then you're going to feel burdened, not because you look and see how unworthy you are. You're going to feel burdened because you realize that God intends you to have all of that, but He thinks that right now what you're doing here is more important. Or else He'd take you and put you where the place has already been prepared for you. The Apostle Paul didn't go around every day thinking about old wretched man that he was. No, he got that nailed down. The daily he died. But after he got all that nailed to the cross, what did he do? He picked up the cross and he kept walking. He put it behind him and said, All right, let's get to work. He didn't die daily because it was fun. He died daily because unless he died daily, he couldn't look it through faith at what God had turned him into. The apostle to the Gentiles. Right? The missionary that at that point traveled to every point of the known world to tell about Jesus, knowing that he was going to be beaten and then one day eventually martyred, right? mocked, ridiculed, lied to, taken advantage of. You say, but... We know that the Apostle Paul spent a lot of time in jail. The Apostle Paul had a lot of emotional damage done to him too. Go look at when he wrote to Timothy about all the people that had mistreated Alexander the coppersmith and everybody else that had walked out on him, that had turned their back on him, ran, went back to false religion and false teaching, perverting what Christ had done. He had a whole lot of scars that weren't physical. But yet he didn't look at those scars in the mirror every morning when he woke up. By faith he saw... One day, the Lord's going to come and make everything right. And instead of looking at where I'm at, I want to look at where He's going to take me. I'm not looking at this flesh. I'm looking at that glorified body. 
And to show my appreciation for what He has done in my life, I want to make sure that I am accepted. So what's the first thing you got to accept? You can't look at the flesh and live for the Lord. If your eyes are on what you are now, you're not going to live up to your potential. Long before anybody goes and achieves anything, they have to be able to see themselves achieving it before they'll actually do it. You've got to see yourself as holy because God said, Be ye holy, for I am holy, before you'll go out and live holy. You've got to see yourself as the servant, the minister, the ambassador of Christ before you can go out and do it. But Brother Jordan, I, I don't know what God wants me to be. Well, or I don't know how God's going to make me into it. doesn't matter. You've just got to see yourself that you can be so that by faith you'll embrace it. Because if you're waiting to see it, God will never do it. Because without faith it's impossible to please Him. But Lord, prove it to me. He's already done that. You've got 66 books. Thousands of chapters showing to you that God can do exactly what He says He's going to do. That if He promised to do it for you, there's nothing in heaven, earth, under the earth, out there in outer space, or anywhere else in the universe that can prevent what God wants to happen from happening. So once you see yourself, not in the flesh, but see yourself in the Spirit, then you've got to get to the point that in order to be accepted, you've got to accept that you're going to have to wrestle that flesh. It'd be too easy if God said, just forget about the flesh. Now you're stuck with it. Right, Peter Pan, anybody remember that tale? He lost his shadow. Right, he's looking for it, but the shadow didn't want anything to do with him. Okay, and then eventually they find it, and then they sewed it to the bottom of his feet again. Don't understand how that makes sense, but it was a kid's story. They sewed his shadow back onto him, where it couldn't be separated. You're sewed together with this flesh. The flesh don't want to be a part of your spiritual body, and your spiritual body don't want to be a part of the flesh. They're at enmity with one another, but they're sewn together. In fact, they're fitted together. That means they can't be pulled apart unless God does it, because God's the one that put them together. It'd be too easy to say, well, let's just cut them strings and let the flesh loose. Can't do that. The hard part is to say, well, in order to be accepted of God, I see what He wants to make me into, so we've got to make this thing go that way. We've got to drive this vehicle down the right road. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. We know that that's the direction God wants us to go, and even though everything in the carnal man says that's the way we should go, you've got to convince it to go that way. And I'm not talking about making deals with it. Well, if we go to church, then later on today, we'll go out and we'll go fishing and pretend that we're sick and miss church tonight. No, we heard about that yesterday. You can't make compromises with your flesh and then still expect to live godly. What am I saying? You've got to compel it to go this way. You've got to put reins on it like a horse. And even though that horse is a whole lot stronger than you, that horse could kill you with one kick if it wanted to. And if he's dumb enough to stand behind it. Right? That horse is, I dare say, according to, you know, if we put some people next to a horse, there's horses out there that are smarter than some people I know. Right? But it's cunning. It may not be the most intelligent thing in the world, but it knows how to avoid you if it wants to avoid you. And because it's a horse, you can't just grab it by the ear and then pull it along no that thing's a whole lot stronger than you you're no match for your own flesh without the Lord Jesus Christ it's a whole lot stronger than you why because it's in its element it's in a sin cursed world that's ruled by sin that's driven by sin and if you let it get plugged into the world it's going to overpower you every day of the week right we're pilgrims and strangers to this world we draw our strength from a heavenly source and I know that if I get tapped into God, He'll give me the strength to compel the flesh. But all it takes is one looking, you know, one second where you think, well, 
We finally got that nailed down, and then what happens? It breaks through the gate, and it's running out in the pasture again. But to be accepted, you've got to understand that every day you're going to have to wrestle with that flesh. I've used this illustration before, but Jesus took his cross to Calvary and he left it there. Why? Because he's done with it. He only needed it once. He wasn't there for his sin, he was there for our sin. So he was able to make the payment once. But when everybody else in all of his ministry says, Lord, what would you have us do? Take up your cross and follow me. I don't find that he ever tells you to put your cross down. Why? Because you need it more than once. We take our cross with us. Why? Because we're supposed to nail the flesh to it every day. If you're not paying attention, that sucker's liable to jump up off of there because he wriggled a few of them nails loose. You overlook something and all of a sudden he's got a gap where he can take that nail out and then next thing you know he's got a hand free to start pulling other nails out. We take our cross with us because I can't get rid of the flesh, but I can keep him nailed to it. I can make it to where he ain't jumping up and having free reign in it. What's that? It may be stronger than me. It be, may be more determined than me. More persistent. But it is not stronger than God. The horse is stronger than the cowboy, but why is it following him? Because he asserts authority over it, dominance over it. He trains it with the bit in its mouth to know as long as you go the way that the bit tells you to, there's no pain. As long as you do what the bit tells you to do, we're not going to have any, we're not going to fall off a cliff, we're not going to run into a ditch. What you say? You can control something that you think is way above your head. Not just like a horse, but also James gives us the illustration of the, the mighty ships use a very small rudder, but yet it steers the whole ship. But you've got to be willing to every morning wake up and put that harness on your flesh. You've got to wake up every morning and make sure that them chains and the rigging are still connected to the rudder on your ship so that when you turn, the flesh responds. Why? Because it's fun to do every day? No, because we want to be accepted of Him. Well, goes on to say, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor. If you go look up that word labor, very interesting definition. But labor, we think nowadays, just means hard work. That's not what labor in the Bible meant. Labor in the Bible says, make it our aim. You labor because you got a point that you're aiming for, and you're doing everything you can to make sure you hit it. You do not labor in something unless you've got a plan. You may go work, but when you go to work every day, you're not laboring for what you think. You're laboring for whatever the boss man says. You're working for somebody else's goal. Labor is when you've got a goal and you've made it your aim. If you're the one that's got the conviction about what it is that you're doing, that means that you're going to give it your all. Labor implies that you're giving it 100%. Labor implies that it's the most important thing in your life. So why is the Apostle Paul laboring down here to be accepted? His goal is to be in the smack dab perfect will of God but then also to be doing the exact down to the jot and tittle perfect will of God in his life being used of God he wasn't happy being on the sidelines he says Lord if I'm stuck in this flesh let's wear it out let's go use it for your honor and your glory as we labor that whether we be absent or present we may be accepted of him goes on to say in verse 10 for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he had done whether it be good or bad he's writing to the church to save folk 
They say, we labor. I've made it my aim that when I stand before Him one day, and our God is a consuming fire, because He is righteous and holy, nothing unrighteous or unholy can even approach unto Him. His righteousness consumes it. So when we stand before Him and we grab all of those labors of our life, and we pick them up and we approach the throne of God, I wonder how much of it's just going to vaporize. Like as it was wood, hay, and stubble. We thought it was real valuable. We thought that it was worth putting our effort into, but it doesn't even make it to God when we stand before Him because it's not going to pass the fire of God in order for us to approach unto Him. God knowing that when He looks at it, He sees what's really going to make it through the fire. Every day He's pulling on your heartstrings saying, won't you make it your labor to be accepted of me? Not just here, but there. One of the greatest joys, aside from being, one, knowing you'll never be separated from God for all of eternity. Two, being able to fellowship with Him for all of eternity. But I find that one of the greatest honors and joys in a saint's life is when we're able to lay down those things that He rewards us with for our labors down here, and we get to lay them at His feet as a token of our love and appreciation of Him. And just like there's so many people we know and the Bible talks about there will be those that are searching through the book of life, looking for their name, saying, Lord, didn't we do all these things for you? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we preach? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And they'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I can't imagine the heartbreak and the wails that will happen when they realize their name isn't in God's book. But I wonder what it's going to be like when some people grab up those treasures from down here and they walk and they realize everything that they thought God thought was valuable disappeared. Because they was planning on throwing a whole lot down at his feet only to realize everything that they labored for didn't make a hill of beans. The Apostle Paul didn't leave it to chance. He said, I'm going to make it my labor that I will be found accepted. Not just down here, but there. Because you can't have one without the other. You can't be accepted over there without being accepted down here by God. And you can't be accepted down here without laying up treasures in heaven that are gold, silver, and precious gems that are going to pass the fire of God's judgment. But he says, we walk by faith, not by sight. In order to be accepted of God, you can't look at what you're doing now. You've got to be concerned with what's coming tomorrow. Pay attention to what you're doing today. Because I believe that a good servant, right, is meticulous about what he's doing. But if we're not careful, we get too caught up in what we're doing and all we're looking at is now. I do find that today is all that we have. We're not promised tomorrow. No man knows what a day brings forth. But I also find that what we ought to say is, is that if the Lord wills it, tomorrow we're going to go down into such and such a city and buy, sell, get gain, if it's God's will. You know what that tells me? God's got a plan for tomorrow, so you should have a plan for tomorrow. But if you walk by sight, all you care about is today. Because that's all you can see, it's all you can feel, it's all you can experience. The Apostle Paul said, I may be in a jail cell today, but by faith I believe that tomorrow I'm going to be preaching to somebody. We walk by faith. You can try and walk by sight, but you're not going to be walking very long. You're going to be crippled. You're going to be pulled along by somebody else. Something that you thought you had control of is going to be dragging you through the streets if you try to walk by sight. But if you walk by faith, this being a lamp under your feet and a light under your path, the Holy Ghost being the one that's supposed to lead and guide you into all truth, to shed light from the Word of God to your soul, knowing that we've got a lighthouse in heaven showing us the way to make it back home. We know which way land is. Why? Because He's there waving, telling us, hey, it's this way. 
You can't make sense of how to walk by faith using sight. There is no map that says, go here 38 paces, turn right, go that way. That's not faith. Faith is when the Holy Ghost says, hang a right, and you say, Lord, that's a cliff. And he says, hang a right, you hang a right. Or when he says, hey, hang a left, Lord, that's a river, and I'm in a car. And it's not one of them boat cars from back in the 70s and 80s where they thought that was going to be cool, right? It's not one of them weird things. It's car car. It ain't going to go, hang a left. All right, Lord. See, in order to make a spiritual impact, you have to be spiritually led. In order to be accepted in spirit with God, you've got to spiritually let Him take you where He wants to lead you. How many times do you find people in the Bible discouraged, defeated, saying, Lord, just kill me, take me home. No sense in it anymore. Elijah under the juniper tree. As one example. Saying, Lord, it's not worth it anymore. Jeremiah, Lord, I preached till my lungs became leather. They're just as stiff-necked and hard-hearted as their fathers were. Lord, what's the point anymore? What happened? For a little bit, they started looking with the eyes of the flesh. Started walking by sight. And then what happened? God would kindle that fire in them, and all of a sudden they'd start walking by faith again, and they'd realize, Lord, I don't know what I was thinking. Of course you're right. What happened? They got weak in a moment. Don't look down at them. But we're subject to so much more. Apt to do so much less for God. But if you labor, you make it your labor to be accepted of God. What's that mean? That's your aim. And nothing's going to stand between you and what your goal is. Be accepted, you must walk by faith. He saying we, he's talking about himself royally, using that royal sense of, we walk by faith and not by sight, meaning I do it, but it's what everybody ought to do. Why? Because by sight, he starts looking at that flesh. He starts seeing the hands that held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen. He starts looking at things in the past. How do you think he was able to say, forgetting those things which are behind? He wasn't looking at the flesh anymore. He was looking through the eyes of the Spirit. He was saying, I'm not that anymore. God changed my name from Saul to Tarsus to Paul, the prophet, the apostle, the preacher. He says, by faith, I'm looking at what God made me into, not what the world still thinks that I am. And when people would come up and say, hey, aren't you Saul? And he goes, I don't know who that is anymore. I'm Paul. It looked the same, may sound the same, may walk the same. Although chances are he wasn't walking the same because after all the times he'd been tortured and beaten, he walked a little bit different. And they'd say, well, you sound, but you're right, you're different. What's he saying? I'm walking by faith. Won't let others remind me of what I used to be. Won't let my own self remind me of what I used to be. Why? Because there's only defeat that way. There's no victory. The only victory is in embracing, understanding, and seeing yourself as what God will make you into one day. And in pursuing it, making that your goal. Lord, I know that I'm not going to be a recipient of that everlasting house, that perfect vessel. I'm not going to be like Christ till I get to glory, but I'm going to get as close as I can. I'm making it my labor. It means it's the first thing I wake up and think about. It's the last thing I think about before I go to bed. When I'm sitting there and I've got a little bit of free time, it's the first thing that I'm pondering, considering. Most of us, it's the very second we get free time, phone comes out of our pocket. You know what the Apostle Paul was thinking about? How can I be more like Christ? Lord, show me. Realign my aim so that I'm right on target. Well, what was his target? To be like Christ. To be accepted of God. Both here and now and in the future for all of eternity. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.